Hello and welcome to episode 253 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert as always, Damien Fay and me, Andy Links. Damien, how you doing? I'm good. It's good to be back. We're back properly for the for the new year, aren't we? It's been a it's been a mental week because there's been so much going on. I think last week we mentioned that the website was almost in meltdown with the number yeah. of people that were using it. And that trend obviously continues as the new year gets underway. So we've had that almost every day has been a record-breaking day for Money to the Masses. And given, as I said last week, that we've been around for nearly 10 years now, that's incredible. So it's really good to see. And we're pushing out so much content to give you a bit of a peek behind the curtain that we are now pushing out more and more content and getting more and more writers at Money to the Masses writing about all various different topics. And we're even going into the realms of credit cards and things like that. So if you ever have any money-related issues you should always check out the Money to the Masses website. Yeah, bookmark it and use that as your first port of call before you go on because if there isn't an article there, why not be surprised, but let us know and we'll we'll write it for you. Well, it's funny because this week there's an article that's almost been born out of a query that I got that was quite a, a fairly innocuous question about somebody who wants to uh, send their, their child going away on holiday and wants to give them a a card to go away so some form of prepaid card or basically is there an equivalent of something like Revolut for people who are 16 or 17 when they travel and Revolut has an age restriction on the product because it's for people over 18 so we we looked into it and there, there is an answer so I won't give it away on the podcast and Lauren is going to write the article next week so that's how some of the stuff gets born out of people's questions on that note the Facebook community which is, I'm obsessed with the Facebook community. If you're in it, I'm always watching what goes on in the Facebook community. I don't tend to write all the time or that often because I want it to grow organically through, um, to be a community of people talking to each other. And I dip in and out and just watch. You pretty much read every comment that goes in there though, don't you? Yeah, I do, I do try and read most of them because there is an element of, we, we don't censor what goes on in the community group, but obviously there are people exchanging information about money, et cetera. But there are some really smart people in there as well i mean everybody in there is adding value but i know for a fact there are some people in there who are even financial advisors who i have known personally or do know personally who ride in there and share their knowledge and expertise so the whole group is now grown to a thousand people and that's amazing bearing in mind it's only been three months old we've not promoted it in any other way than to talk about it on the podcast in our email and that's incredible and it's showing you the appetite for having a source for people to be able to ask questions or get people's opinions about things about what they're trying to do all sorts of things even products so if you have a question and we are unable to answer it on the podcast or the website due to time constraints always join the Facebook group and answer it in there because you're, what you'll find is some really interesting um, responses. And then there's stuff in there that I've even read that is eye-opening as well So because everybody has their own experiences. So the Facebook group is amazing. And one of the things that really tickled me this week that wasn't quite money-related, yeah. there is a phenomenon that is uh, that started, which is basically money to the masses' pets. <laughs> and people posting pictures of their pets who have received, well, the owners received a a mug for maybe being on the podcast or doing something mug-worthy because the Mug Wall of Fame is back in its original form rather than the Christmas tree calendar. That is back on the wall, so don't forget, do something mug-worthy and you can get a mug, let us know. And people are posting pictures of their pets with Money to the Masses um, mugs or the website and stuff like that, which I love. So uh, a good way to maybe to get a mug and to get a mug worthy sort of shout out would be to post more pictures of your pets and say, look how sad they look. They're missing their mug. They need a mug. <laughs> You're giving people an in. That, that, <laughs> yeah. would, that would tug at my heartstrings. I was joking with Lauren, actually, is on the side before we got on with the show is maybe we need to have money to the masses branded dog cat bowls. <laughs> oh, Yes. <laughs> Do you know, that could actually send it over the edge because my children have been bugging me for years now that they would love a dog or a cat. And uh, I keep saying no. So that might be the thing that sends it over the edge what, for a me. Lo- a lonely cat or dog bowl in your <laughs> yeah. kitchen that you need yeah. an animal for. So, um, yeah, so that's been fantastic. Now, before we go on to the show, there's one tip I actually wanted to talk about, uh, a sort of a mini one that wasn't enough to make it a full piece in the podcast. But as it's a new year, I read around a lot of stuff. So not just in the UK, but in America to see what's happening over there. And one of the pieces that was aimed at the American audience was about the dangers of abbreviating 
the year 2020. I read this, yeah. And I'm not sure whether it's a bit of scaremongering, whether it is in fact... Well, it's, it's worth noting anyway. When you write the date, we all tend to, let's say it was the 1st of August 2019, we might write 1819. Once you've got to 2020, if you abbreviate the year to just put 20, so the 1st of January would be 1 1 and in the 20, the argument is that you make it easier for fraudsters and scammers to be able to doctor the date so they could potentially put extra numbers on the end because with just a two and a zero they could add in maybe a two and a two to make it 2022 in the future so if you were to write checks i know that's a bit old hat or you may just maybe sign contracts or signatures or anything it allows people to be able to forward date or put a date on something that they've got a copy Even of your signature date as well which can be which can be yep. damaging backdating as andy said so if you've got a complaint you're trying to have and someone could backdate so um the tip is don't abbreviate the date on anything you do always put 2020 as the year and that will stop that happening so yeah fraudsters are apparently using this we shall see it's a good tip right what have we got coming up on this week's pod right the first piece is about tax we produced a piece of work called the 39 ways to save tax and it was created before, and we've updated it. It's a guide, and there was a, a bit of discussion around it. Somebody asked for it, and so suddenly we decided to update it again. And I don't think we ever really talked about it on the podcast. Now I'm not going to go through all 39 points, but I want people to uh, pick out. I'm going to pick out a few points for people to listen to and take down. But then they can go and find the other 39 if. They want to. And then the next piece I'm going to do on the podcast is about investing, but particularly about the Middle East and really ge- geopolitical concerns. So at the moment, at the time this podcast has been made, there is obviously the US-Iran concerns and there's not quite a full-blown conflict yet that could potentially happen, although it seems that things are perhaps dying down. But what I want to do is talk about the like the impact of any of these geopolitical things on markets so it doesn't time date the podcast it's learning from history how these things tend to pan out when things go wrong basically when you need to be worried in terms of um, stock markets oil prices etc and the final piece is something that is going to be pushed out next week but you guys are going to get a preview of it is a piece by Jordan Cox Now, Jordan, if you went to the Money to the Masses event at the end of last year, Jordan was one of the panellists and he's known as the Coupon Kid. And Jordan is a, he's, he's a really great guy. He used to write for Money Saving Expert. He is now starting to write content for us. So I did mention at the beginning of the podcast that we get new writers. So he's starting to do bits and pieces for us. And one of the pieces he's done, Andy's going to uh, lead with it and go through it, which is about airport lounges and how they can save you money. I think it's quite a nice piece, especially this time of year when we're all slightly depressed about the weather and we're thinking about going on holiday. Good. So what we're going to start with, are we going to talk about tax, baby? Tax. We're going to talk about tax, Andy. So the 39 ways to save tax, you're going to link to the article in the show notes and i'll also post it in the group when the podcast goes live as well so people in the community can see that and interact with it if yeah need to. and there are obviously there are plenty of other ways you can save tax not just this 39 but there's some nice ideas for people to therefore look at and explore so i'm going to run through a couple of them and then one of the big ones that i just want to focus on mainly at the start is the marriage allowance now this is a tax allowance that allows you to transfer some of your personal allowance to your spouse. And there are caveats to it, but if you are married or in a civil partnership, and let's say you are listening to this podcast and you are a basic rate taxpayer, which generally means you're going to be earning less than £50,000 a year. If you have a spouse that is not using their personal allowance, so the amount that they the tax-free allowance they have for income tax, then that will mean generally they're earning less than 12 and a half grand a year currently. Then you can transfer up to £1,250 of your personal allowance to your husband, wife or civil partner. And if you do the maths in your head, that means if you have that added to your allowance effectively, take 20% of that, that means that you can save £250 in tax. So that is worth having. But the problem is there's millions of people who are eligible for this 
but who don't realise it and don't use it. So it was something that came in back in 2015 that was largely sort of under the radar. We have done a podcast previously on it where we've chatted about the marriage tax allowance and how it works. You can go back and find that. But one of the most important bits that people do not realise, if you are listening to this podcast and you suddenly think, I'm not doing that, I'm not using my partner's or part of my partner's personal allowance, you can actually claim back for up to four years worth that you haven't claimed. Now, to run through the numbers, 2015 to 16, the amount of tax you could have saved was £212. In 2016 to 2017, it was £220. In 2017 to 18, it was £230. In 2018 to 19 tax year, it was £238 of tax you could have saved. And now, currently, it's £250 worth of tax you can save. So if you're listening to this, you suddenly decide, I should have done that. You do it for this tax year and you claim back for those other four tax years. You would actually get basically a tax saving and you would get a total, well, you'd end up getting a rebate, but the total saving would be £1,150. So there will be somebody listening to this podcast who will suddenly realise this is them, this is they're eligible and they should be over a grand better off, which is fantastic. So make sure you go and uh, do that. But the other reason I mention it is because as we are now approaching the last stages of the tax year, once we tick over into the new tax year, you won't be able to claim for the 2015-2016 year if you had been eligible to use that allowance. So that's why you yeah. need to do it now and not wait until next tax year. So the marriage allowance is one. I mean, the other thing... I'm technical detail you have to bear in mind is you have to be both born after the 6th of april 1935 so the chances are you probably are (laughs) but the reason is because there's another allowance for people who are born before that an old allowance called the married couples allowance anyway on to the next one council tax now council tax is something that me and andy were we were talking about in the office and we were moaning about council tax and andy as you all know has just moved house and and he was complaining about the size of his council tax bill. Yeah. Well, I actually don't know the size of my new council tax bill because I've moved to a new build and it's still been, uh, it's currently unbanded, uh, which is frustrating in itself. But my old council tax bill, which I'm still paying, by the way, because they make you continue paying your old bill until they ban the new one. Um, so I might be due a re- rebate. I might owe them money. Who knows? Let's just wait and see. But I pay an astronomical amount, even compared to you who lives closer to London. So it seems to be a bit of a, yeah, a so postcode to you, to, lottery. To give you a context, what I pay in, in London is, I mean, perhaps there's more people and it's the services be able to to be spread more evenly, cost-effectively is the word, yeah. than, than Andy lives out in the uh, sticks. Yeah. I mean, that's fair to say. I know where Andy lives. It's a lovely place. <laughs> if, it's if, in the countryside. If you look on a map and you, you sort of zoom out from, from the village that I live, it's, it's just a sea of green. I mean, it is lovely, but it is quite sort of, you know... Well, you've done a few podcasts from there and we've heard the birds <laughs> in the background. But it does mean that Andy's council tax is probably almost... Well, we worked it out. It's more than 50% higher than mine which yeah. is a for, for very similar properties i mean we're not you yeah. know we're in effectively the same band but we're in different um yeah. council tax regions that's, yeah. that's purely this. so the point of this is that it's expensive and it creeps up and you suddenly think can i reduce it and one of the things you can do is you can challenge the band that you're in because the way council tax works is that your property is put into a band and based upon its value and when you're in that band that's how they assess and charge you in a certain amount but you can be in the wrong band and can have been in the wrong band for, uh, for for years. So you can challenge it. And the way you challenge or, well, first of all, they say you've got to see if you've got grounds for challenging. But what you need to do is you can go onto the .gov.uk website and it's forward slash council tax bands. And you can see what band your your house is in. I can't. You, Andy, <laughs> Andy can't. Andy, Andy's just ruining this section of the podcast. Andy can't yet yeah. find out. But let's will, assume we can. But let's assume. Mo- 99% of people listen to this podcast will be yeah. able to. Don't be Andy. <laughs> assume you will find your, your, the band that you're in, but you can also look and see the bands that your neighbours are in. So let's say you live in a street where houses are all very similar, which is the norm, to be honest with you, and your neighbour is on a different band to you, then they may be on a cheaper band, then you may be being overcharged. And so you can appeal it. You can actually contact the council and challenge them and say you should be on the lower band like your neighbours, but you need to have a case. So if all your neighbours have the same house as you and there's been no sort of 
changes to the houses like in terms of development of them and you feel that you're overpaying then you can challenge it and have your band reduced but the other thing you need to do you need to also check the value of the property because it's based upon the bands were based upon valuations back in 1991 it was just the way when council tax came in and they did the banding they basically drove around in a car it was called first gear valuations at the time but they drive around in the car looking at the street going yeah they're in that band i reckon they're worth about that much the point is it wasn't really the most scientific of things so you can get people in the same street on different bands but what you end up doing is if you've bought your house since 1991 you can use a calculator nationwide has one where you can backdate the value of your house to 1991 to see which band you should be in the point is if you go on our website we explain this in full detail if you put in council tax or click on the headers on the menus and if your valuation suggests you're in the wrong band and you're in the and your neighbor is in a different band you could challenge it and therefore have your band reduced you could get a tax rebate and you can even get rebates for thousands of pounds going back a number of years so yeah you could get up to like say five grand in a rebate and people have done that i mean there is the flip side if yeah, you if i know you, what's coming <laughs> if, if you if you get it wrong and your neighbors are the wrong band and there should be higher you could inadvertently push your neighbor's band up and um i was talking to justin about this coincidentally we all we, i mean we talk about these things in the office and he was telling me about somebody he knows uh who happened to mention that they're in the process of doing this but they know that the neighbor at the bottom of their garden is the um, person who's on the other band and they asked will the person know who challenged the banding and the and the council said they would oh. i'm not sure whether that's true or not but if they said it is who am i to disagree but you could end up having your neighbours banding go up. And let's be honest, I mean, you might upset them, but it's only fair. But I've heard stories where a whole street has gone up um, because one person challenged it, but they didn't know who did it. So I don't think people do generally know who challenges it. Moving on to the next thing, ISAs. Use your ISA allowance because if you've got any investments or you have cash, you can obviously use your ISA allowance. We'll come on to the savings allowance in a minute because there's obviously um, a trade-off with that. But if you've got investments then use your ISA allowance, use your spouse's ISA allowance or ensure they use it. Don't forget that the, the days of bed and breakfasting have gone. That was when people used to have investments and then they'd sell them at the end of a tax year to use their CGT allowance because everyone has a, a council, uh, capital gains tax allowance and then buy it back the next day. So therefore they've basically crystallized some gains. So when they ultimately get rid of the investments in totality, their tax bill is lower. You can't do that now. But what you can do is things like bed and spousing, it's called, which sounds far kinkier than it actually is. But it's just you you sell an investment that's in your name and then your spouse buys it back in their own name the next day. So the investment has broadly been kept within the family, but it's actually you've sold yours, they've bought the same thing and there is no implication. The other one is you could do is bed and icering, which is where you might have an investment outside of an ISA, but you can then buy it back the next day if you sell it. You can then buy the same shares, maybe. I mean, they're not your ones, but another. You can invest again in the similar in the same thing. But you've got a bit of a risk where it's sitting outside. Of course, you've the got that. You've got the you've got the trans the, the period where you've cashed in one investment and you're sitting there, and then you obviously the next day will buy another one, and that is potentially markets can move. But it means you might be able to use your capital gains tax allowance. Now, the savings allowance I mentioned that earlier. It's something most people don't really uh, realize. There are two savings allowance you have your personal allowance always it's income tax but you have a starting rate for savings which is dependent on your income which basically means you can get up to five thousand pounds of interest tax free and it's dependent on how much you earn because it's tapered down so if you earn over seventeen and a half thousand pounds then you don't get anything but everybody also has a personal savings allowance so if you're a basic rate taxpayer that's worth a thousand pounds worth of interest a year to you that will be tax free this is why i mentioned about isas because some people are wondering whether it's worth having an isa if you can get savings free a thousand pounds worth high rate taxpayers only get like half of that allowance they get 500 pounds worth of the personal savings allowance if you go back to episode 226 i talk about it in detail so there's more information there but the point is that you can save and get interest paid with paying minimal tax. One thing I always point out when people talk about the savings allowance versus ISAs is that the rules can change. And that, by that I mean that at some point they could remove the savings allowance. They're very unlikely to move the uh, stocks and shares or cash ISA. 
phenomenon that's likely to never be changed because it'd be be uproar but the given that the personal savings allowance was a relatively new thing wouldn't be surprised if, if this government or another government may ultimately get rid of it. Check your tax code. So that's one of the big things. Get your pay slip if you're on pay, PAYE. Go to Listen to Taxman, which is a website that has a tax calculator on it. Put in the gross amount you pay. See if the amount that comes out the other end on the calculator is the same on your pay slip. And then that will probably mean that you're on the right tax code. If not, check your tax code and you can check it against the HMRC, the .gov.uk website, which has a list of all the tax codes. But everybody generally is on the same tax code. And just a brief one on that. If you've had a big bonus or are due to receive a big bonus, you may find it slightly skewed in that one month that you check it. So check it again the next month. Andy used to work in accounts and tax because the other one is when people have two jobs that's the other problem isn't yeah. it that they end up having to make sure that their personal allowance is applied to one job yeah. because you will end up you can end up pay, being paid um almost an emergency rate on the other one you just need to make sure that the amount of tax you are paying is correct it's amazing how many people don't um one of the make a will is an important thing if you want to try and save tax i'm talking about inheritance tax here so if you speak to a solicitor they will help you with it there was an interesting conversation within the facebook community actually this week where someone was talking about a will and somebody made a very good point that people overlook is that they might assume that your pension falls inside your will and it doesn't you have a separate expression of wish that you have attached to it and it means it falls outside of your estate and actually and what i didn't realize is you can effectively give your pension to anyone there's you, no set rules in you, can, you can you can inherit a pension without paying any tax now jumping on to other inheritance tax pieces make sure you know about your allowances that people have a three thousand pound allowance there's more information obviously on the money to masses website but you can carry forward an unused allowance for a year so your rules are there you can read about them but there are set things you can give to people if they get married set amount that isn't going to um, incur any inheritance tax so make sure you look into that before you get to the point where you're going to be too concerned about inheritance tax and you might struggle to do too much about it because you can always give money away salary sacrifice was an interesting thing that came up in the facebook group again and i'm going to just mention it because people can go and find the topic in question but someone was asking about paying into a pension whether they're going to pay into a pension themselves say a sip or a personal pension or whether they were going to pay into their company pension and of course, the point is that you can use salary sacrifice to pay into, say, a, a company arrangement, but you can save national insurance by doing so. But more importantly, the company can as well. And some companies will take that saving of national insurance and pay it into your pension as well. It's so, like a little boost, yeah. Yeah, so it's something to bear in mind. And it's something that was often overlooked, but it's a way of effectively benefiting from saving tax so i mean i could go on and on i'm just conscious of the time now i've just noticed it so we're gonna move on that is it for that on tax but if you're interested go and find the article on the website or click on the link yeah great stuff i'll make that easy for people to see in the community group as well so what have we got next investing yes investing and and i've mentioned the facebook group a couple of times it is because there's a lot of interesting stuff that goes on there and i want to get people excited about it and realize how much good stuff goes on in in that facebook group and if you're not a member do join there was a question that somebody put in there about it was a slightly the way they phrased it was basically they'd read the stars i think it was and said there was going to be a war yeah. and then they led on to a question which was effectively what would happen to the stock market if the us and iran issue escalated or carried on and i didn't answer the question in the group i left 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 it to others to do it because funny enough i was in the process of answering it for 8020 investor members now if you're an 8020 investor member you will have received a newsletter yesterday that talked about this and what would be the potential implications of what we need to be worried about i talk about oil gold and the stock market now I'm going to well, give a bit of that away, partly to show people what happens in an 80-20 investor, the value that's there that if you want it. But obviously, I'm not going to give it all away. But also because I was quoting somebody else's research, it wasn't something that was bespoke that I'd created exclusively for 80-20 investor members. This was something that was a piece of research that was conducted by a company in America. And they were talking about the impact of geopolitical events on the stock market and they looked at the US stock market and went back as far as World War II to see the impact of events on the S&P 500 which is the main stock market in America and so when I talk about events I'm talking about the current Iran issue although it's unresolved there was um, drone strikes if you remember last year that was on a Saudi 
Saudi Arabian oil refinery. It was uh, Iran was accused of being behind that. Um, we've had the Madrid bombings, the US terror attacks, 9-11, the invasion of Iraq, we've had Pearl Harbor, we've had the Cuban Missile Crisis. So you can see there's a lot of geopolitical events over time and what is the impact. And I'll give you the headline stuff about this. The headline numbers were that across all of these events, and there's quite a, a range of reactions from the stock market, but the uh, the total drawdown, the average total drawdown, and when I say drawdown, that means from the point where the market goes from where it was to the bottom, so the top to the bottom, that, that's the drawdown. The total drawdown on average was 5%. So that isn't particularly large at all by any means. That's not even classed as a correction in stock markets. A correction is normally when the market falls by 10% and a bear market is when the stock market falls by 20%. I mean, those are arbitrary numbers that have been assigned to it, but that's the broadly accepted definition. So this is a 5% pullback. So if we look at this today in that context, then the 5% pullback still hasn't occurred at the moment, but it shows you and it helps explain why, if you look at the stock market since the killing of the Iranian commander, that the market did fall. It pulled back about, it is worse, less than 1%, but has largely just shrugged it off and we've hit new all-time highs. If you listen and watch midweek markets this week, then you would have heard me talk about the fact that the market seemed to be pretty sanguine about the whole situation. But it is perhaps a little bit complacent at the moment. Markets are all-time highs. You were just getting newer and new and newer all-time highs. But history does suggest that there perhaps is some validity to that. There's a reason behind it. And the biggest one-day falls, or the average one-day falls, I should say, was about 1%, just over 1%. And the market took about, when it hit the bottom, it took typically about just over a month to recover from any sort of drawdown. Now, the one thing I'll add to that is that if you looked at the numbers, there is some sort of devil in the detail. In amongst those relatively benign pullbacks were some significant ones. So the biggest drawdowns are there's one of 11%, one of nearly 17%, there's one of nearly 13%, and one of 20%. And those incidents, if you look at them, they were the US terror attacks, we're talking 9-11, the invasion of Kuwait, so the Iraqi war, Pearl Harbor, and North Korea invading South Korea. So two of those involved direct large-scale attacks on American soil, which is almost obviously unheard of historically. And the others involved war, and in particular the one with America was obviously Iraq. So we had the invasion of Kuwait, which obviously led to the Iraqi war ultimately. So that says if history is to be believed, that if the Iran-US situation escalated into some form of a war, a full-blown conflict, then we would see a significant pullback. But if not, then markets move on pretty quickly when it comes to geopolitical concerns, and particularly geopolitical concerns in the Middle East. So there's a message there that everybody, the headlines were panicking, but perhaps the stock market and investors weren't just being complacent they were just looking back at what happened in history and taking a lesson from it okay so that takes us on to the last piece andy which i know you're going to i'm not going to put pressure on you to rattle through but i'm just <laughs> conscious of the time so be quick um <laughs> the piece by jordan is a money saving angle and these things are always popular we like to try and vary the stuff on the podcast we've had a heavy tax piece we've had a fairly heavy investment piece this have something a little bit lighter in terms of money saving and this is something that i've personally done myself being in an airport lounge and paid money not because i was necessarily trying to save money but because i couldn't sit anywhere else and if it was crowded and then realized it was relatively cost effective and went in there and then thought actually that didn't work out too bad so jordan has taken that and done some full analysis and andy Take it away. Yeah, so let's get on the lighthearted stuff. Thinking about holidays, we've all been to an airport lounge where it's been busy and hectic and it always seems to cost the earth and you can't seem to get anywhere to sit and there's no plug points. So Jordan researched this and looked into airport lounges. Now, we're not talking about the exclusive business class or first class lounges. They are generally the reserve of the rich. So we're talking about airport lounges where you can actually pay a fee to go and sit in a nice room. It's normally air-conditioned in the summer. 
there'll be some food on offer and normally some alcohol some reading materials and things like that so it's a place that you can rest think of it like if you go to a if you go to a nice Sorry, I, was, I, I thought you were going to say there's a place you get pissed <laughs> yeah, <well. laughs> oh that's two weeks in a row i've lost the explicit rating but anyway move on sorry andy so we've all been to one of those hotels that kind of has has a conference suite think of it like a conference suite there's some nice seating and because because you're paying a fee to be in there, you're going to ensure that it's not going to be crowded and you are going to be able to get a seat and you are going to be able to charge your laptop. So what are the cost implications? How much did it cost? Because a lot of people think these things cost the earth. If you think about the last time you went to the airport, you've probably paid for some food. You've probably paid for some drinks. You've probably paid for some snacks, sweets, books, magazines. And the average cost is around about £52 that that people spend at an airport before they board a flight. Now, that might sound a lot, but when you break it down, and Jordan's done this in the article, I won't go through the numbers, but airports are expensive. So, you know, I, I don't find that figure too surprising. But having crunched the numbers, Jordan's looked at every single airport in the UK and how much it would cost you to pay to go into one of these airport lounges. And again, in this airport lounge, you're going to get access to plug points, decent seating, food and drink. Um, and that's free. That's the point. The food and drink is free. Yeah, I don't like using the word free because you're paying for it, but I know what you mean. It's included yeah, sort of, within yeah, the cost. Yeah, sort of, it's, it's included yeah. within the cost of the of the airport lounge. So looking at the numbers, I mean, the average cost is around about £25 for to, an adult. To gain access to, to gain access to all of this. Now that's food, drink and everything else. So I'm looking over Andy's shoulder and he's got a list of every airport in Basically, that must be every airport in the UK. Yeah, that's right. And if we look at the list, just quickly down, I mean, the cheapest is Southampton at £21.50. Again, check out the article for the full list. And and the most expensive is around about £35 for it. And, and he actually tells you the lounges as well. It gives you the name of the lounge that he's looked at. He's gone into some detail there. But what about if you want to go in with a family, a partner, you can, children cheaper? Yes. Yeah, so actually, really surprisingly, London Gatwick North, even though it's not the cheapest for the adult price, their child price is only twelve pounds. So when you when you crunch the numbers, a family of four could go in there for seventy quid. It's a shame you can't just send your kids in there to be babysat. <laughs> yeah. Tell them to grab all the food and then come back out when the flight's due. So in summary, you always think that these lounges are going to be super expensive, but when you when you total up how much you spend at an airport, I'd consider it. Have a look, see how much they are. And on the article, we explain how you get these airport lounge passes. And actually, you can also do something where you can buy a season ticket, which gains you multiple access and actually reduces the overall cost every time you go. So, and, and does that give you access to airports in other places, not just in the UK? Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's worldwide. So you're now getting, gaining access to around 1,300 airports across the world. Yeah. So I've, I've looked at the article with Andy. It's a great piece. It will be published just after this podcast is out so you can go and have a look at it you can see the breakdown by airport how much you could potentially save and as i say i've done this in the past where i've been and it's just a trade-off do you want something that's quite comfortable with some okay like decent enough food access to wi-fi and a plug point and everything versus being herded into eat or some other dodgy pub thing at the airport so there you go Good stuff. So that's it for this week. If you want to get in touch with Damien, you can do so. It's Damien at moneytothemasses.com. Twitter is at money to the masses with a number two. We're on Instagram. We're on YouTube. We're all over the place. We're smashing Facebook and leave us a review. Please do leave us a review because they help us go up the iTunes charts. We will try and read them out as well. There was one we got, I think, at the end of 2019, literally the last day almost of 2019, which was a very good review. I was a going to read out i haven't got it to hand which said how much they loved the podcast the chit chat and even the fact that me and andy are family men which i thought was a nice touch actually so do leave us a review we will try and read them out so that's it we're done until next time yeah until next time 